Right, let's get into session one. I'd like to invite Pastor Jay Kumar to please come and share with us. All right, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Praise God. It's awesome when, uh, when all of us get together, and especially when we get together as men. And I'm sure that God has something uh, for us to release in us. And um, yeah, we we'll just position ourselves. And yeah, a warm welcome to all of you who are joining online. Please do share the link. Um, and uh, you know, let's uh, let's get in. You know, today uh, we're looking at um, uh, every man's battles. You know, plural battles. Um, last year we looked at real man. What does it mean to be a real man? And this year we're looking at every man's every real man's battles. Right. So. Um, so it's about real men, it's uh, real stories, real struggles, real challenges, right? So nothing fake, it's all real, okay? So just turn to your neighbor and say, it's real. <laughs> okay. So, you know, some of these struggles that, um, uh, that we as men specifically, we go through, you know, we think um, it's unique to me, right? I'm the only one in the whole world or maybe in this entire universe who's going through this struggle and uh, everyone else is, is fine, you know, is living life um, fine and they are spiritually growing and enjoying and I'm the only one who's going through this. You know, the other extreme is we might think, um, you know, everyone is going through this struggle, we are men after all and so it's okay. I don't need to do anything about it, um, everyone is going through this. And some of us might be thinking, hey, this is too shameful, this is too painful to even talk about. It is too perverse. How can I even bring it up? And where can I bring it up? Right? So it's just there below the surface and uh, we're just struggling. So today, um, as we start off, I just want to read you know, a couple of uh, real uh, stories, uh, real confessions, okay? And you can follow through uh, in the notes that you have. I had expected the journey of purity to be easier than this. I had figured I could easily get rid of all the sexual junk in my life. But I couldn't. Every week I said I wouldn't look at those newspaper ad inserts. But every Sunday morning, the striking photos compelled me to lust. Every week, I'd vow to avoid watching R-rated movies when I traveled on business, but every week, I'd fail. I'd promise never to do it again, but I always did. What I'd done after becoming a believer was simply trade the pornography of Playboy and Gallery for the pornography of ad inserts and other magazine ads. I wasn't considering extramarital affairs. But I was certainly having mental affairs and daydreams, affairs of the eyes and heart. In short, while the pornography was gone, the sin remained. I'd never truly rejected my visual feasting upon women. I'd merely changed where I went for a meal. This is Stephen, a church-going believer, a businessman. Another real story. On our way to buy a drink at a convenience store, Billy told me about something called masturbation. I'd never heard that word, so he explained what it was. He said all the guys had been experimenting with it. I couldn't get what he told me out of my mind, so that night I tried it. Since then, more than 15 years ago, I haven't gone more than a week without masturbating. I always thought marriage would take the desire away. But it isn't any better, and I'm so ashamed. Not just by the act itself, but also by the things I think about and the movies I watch while doing it. I know it's adulterous. Howard, a Sunday school teacher. And there are many such stories. Some of them we could relate to, some of them we could identify with. Many stories across age groups, across profession, no matter who we are, there are stories, real stories, real confessions of struggles, of challenges, of pain. 
Listen to what Dr. Vasan, this is old data, 2017, of Manipal fertility. This is what he says. Um, there has been an alarming rise in the number of male patients who are coming in with porn addiction after they get hooked to watching porn on their mobile phones. Um, another doctor, Sharma, again, this is old data from Nimans, says the con consequences of porn addiction is discrepancy in relationships lack of productivity and disturbances on both personal and professional levels. Mainly, it leads to behavioral disorder. So we see that there is a availability of porn, easily available, it's easily accessible, and it is affordable. So men and boys get exposed to this alarmingly at a very young age, very young age. You know, if you thought, okay, you know, 15 years, uh, I was 15 years old when I got exposed to this, but these days they are getting exposed to it at an alarmingly young age and because of technology and because of smartphones and it's easily accessible. And so it results, it has consequences. It has consequences. It leaves a mark, it exacts a price. It is not, oh, it's all, you know, all men. We are all men anyway. You know, we are all boys anyway. That doesn't hold good because it, it exacts a heavy price. And the Lord Jesus, you know, talks about this and, 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 and scripture. And I'm, I'm, 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 and 17 um, warns us, it says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So in the word of God, it says, yeah, this is there. You know, there's no point in wishing it away. It is there. These realms of desire. It is there in the world. He says that, and John writes and he says, you know, it is there in the world. It is of the world. What is it? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Pride of life, we're talking about, you know, maybe desire for money and fame and status and position and desire for control and all that. So all these realms, the Bible says it is there. So we need to acknowledge, hey, it is there in this world. It is very much part of this world. And us and all of us as men, you know, we are uniquely created and positioned for fulfilling the plans and purposes of God. But the way we are created, we need to understand it is to be in the plan of God, it is to be in the purpose of God, which is good. And we are created beautifully, fearfully and wonderfully. But then we need to understand how we are created. Because if you don't understand, then we get drawn into these realms of desire. Right? Being men, our eyes, you know, as a man, you and I have a natural desire, it's God-given to be attracted to a woman. And God meant this attraction to be for a woman, your spouse, your wife. And God meant this desire, this God-given natural desire to be fulfilled. It's not that you have the desire and it's just there. No, God meant this desire to be fulfilled. And how? It is God-ordained manner, fulfilled in a marriage in a covenant relationship. So God created us like this. We are visual, we are drawn, we are drawn to the opposite sex, and we have this desire. There's no point in saying, you know, this desire is wrong. No, God created us in this way. But God meant for us to fulfill this desire in a way that he created us, he designed us for in a covenant relationship. So. There is the temptation in the world through the lust of the flesh, through the lust of the eyes to, to fulfill that desire 
and attraction in ways that God did not ordain. Right? Sex before marriage, sex outside of marriage, adultery, or any kind of perversion, homosexuality or incest or you know, even fantasizing um, accompanied by masturbation. And as men, we get excited and we get sexually aroused when we look at you know, female body parts, nudity. You know, a picture need not have a face. You know, we, not, we need not know the person, right? any stranger. But if that stranger is scantily clothed or if, if body parts are exposed, then as men, there is a stirring. We are drawn. And this is, that's how we are wired. We are wired. In fact, we are wired to receive sexual gratification through our eyes. Just think about that, right? Because, the, because you know, I think I'm sure medical doctors are here, and I'm sure medical professionals will say that you know we will receive gratification. There are hormones, there are neurotransmitters that are that are released. You know, something called epinephrine, something called dopamine is released, and it it rewards us. So there is a sense of gratification without the actual act itself. And that's, for, that's why the Lord Jesus, you know, he says in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 27 and 28, he says, You have heard that it was said, of, said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Verse 28, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So he's acknowledging, hey, this is how. It is, so, but if you're going to look, if you're going to linger, if you're going to lust, then you've already, you're gratifying yourself, you've already committed adultery in your heart. He's talking about a high standard. So, this sexual gratification, you know, visual, sensual gratification is a kind of foreplay. Foreplay where our body gets ready for sexual intercourse. It's getting ready for sex. And if there's no sexual sex partner in sex, then it's getting ready for masturbation. Right? So this is through the eyes. And the culture around, you know, pours out, knows this, and pours out images, visuals, videos, and, you know, advertisements, movies, uh, whatever you, you call it, you know, in social media. Why is it? Have you ever wondered, you know, why is it there's a furniture ad and there's a scantily clad woman? Why? Because if they put just a furniture, a beautiful furniture, we men are not going to look at it. <laughs> right? We'll say, okay, yeah, uh, I just move on. But if there is a woman, and because we are designed in this manner, our eyes lock on to the image. And this epinephrine which is released, apparently it's, it, it actually solidifies that memory. So next time you go shopping and you go and look at a furniture, you know, that, if that image is there, then it locks on. It creates a, a reward and, and you feel, you know, inclined, okay, maybe this is something which is good. Maybe I should buy this. So manufacturers of products and services and even entertainment and arts and everything, they know that, you know, you put that image then we've got it. We've got a potential customer. And so for the undiscerning male, for the unguarded male, it becomes, sometimes it becomes a normal way of life and it results in even an addiction, resulting in broken marriage because we're giving into it and we want to try certain things out. We are not satisfied with who we are with. There's always comparison and we're saying, okay, this maybe this one, this person can satisfy, this experience can satisfy. Casual, multiple sexual relationships and secret shameful lives of sexual addictions. Culture and conversation with peers you know, normalizes this and say, you are male, this is how it is, this is how the world is, go with it. What about our brain? You know, we receive signals through our eyes and it goes to our, our, brain, our brain and it processes and, fun and uh, you know, it, we act on it. 
It analyzes. And in his book, um, Norman Doidge, in the book, The Brain That Changes, he described two types, he describes two types of pleasure. One that, that anticipates. You know, if you're anticipating a meal, imagining a good meal, maybe like a biryani or something, you know, there is that exciting pleasure, the very anticipation of it, the very imagination of it, you know, gives you pleasure. And he also talks about satisfying pleasure, says, where you, when you have the meal, the actual meal, the actual experience, there is a satisfaction. You know, there are these endorphins which are released and, there is this, and it creates a sense of euphoria as a pleasurable experience and bliss and we are satisfied. Right? So he talks about that. But what happens is that when we watch porn, we're talking about, when you say porn, you know, we don't have to think of hardcore porn, it could be soft porn, it could be anything sexually explicit in nature, or even subtly you know, explicit in nature. When we watch that, this is what happens. It hyperactivates our appetite system and keeps the viewer excited and longing for it, but it does not satisfy. So the person goes back over and over again because... That anticipation is there, but there is no satisfaction. It increases the dopamine levels in our brain. And it's part of our reward system. It gives a reward. There's a chemical high. And, you know, some of the, and apparently there was a presentation in the U.S. Senate about it. And, and a doctor, I forget the name, but the doctor mentions that, you know, it is like cocaine or heroin. The kind of addiction, the kind of bonding, the kind of, you know, drawing to um, explicit images or porn, you know, it's, it's like that. Because the brain gets a hit every time. And maybe, you know, we may not be, you know, reduced to living that kind of a lifestyle of a drug addiction. But on the inside, the struggle is real. And we're thinking, what's wrong with me? Believers, spirit-filled, moving in the gifts and etc. What's wrong with me? There's a chemical high and it draws. And another thing that he mentions is this, that you know, there we have these neurons and there's a neural pathway that is uh, like, a, like a railroad track which is laid out. Every time we, you know, we do something and there's a reward and it becomes habitual. We want to do it again. We want to be consistent because there's a reward. You know, we watch something, there's a reward. We feel good. We feel high. We get that chemical. We want to do it again. We're drawn to do it again. So we do that over and over again. And there is a neural pathway, right? There's a, there's a railroad. There's a rail track which is laid out. So the next time it becomes stronger, it becomes easier. And we don't even think there's no reason that can stand in the way. No, there's no red signal or there's no level crossing there. It's like green all the way. And even if there are red signals, even if there are level crossings, even if there's danger, you know, the train just goes. It doesn't care. Against all reason, against all pleas, it just leaves. It just goes. You look at some data, you know, internet pornographic traffic. Number one is Delhi. And number two is Bangalore. And they say that, this is old data again, uh, they say that 30% of all internet bandwidth in India is towards pornographic websites. And India ranks number three in porn consumption. So there seems to be almost like a, you know, a pandemic, a sexual pandemic, affecting all men, all ages, teens, young adults, Working professionals, you're single, married, widowed, retired, doesn't matter. No matter what profession we are in, we could be pastors or you know, ministry, in ministry, doesn't care, doesn't matter. And this pandemic you know, stops men from stepping into the fullness of call that God has for us, the purpose that God has for us, the destiny that God has for us. And a, a pandemic resulting in objectifying of women. So much so that it leads to a lack of intimacy, real intimacy in marriage. We're not able to relate anymore. 
and there's an inability to have a healthy and a holy relationship with other women because every time you see we see them as objects of pleasure to be had to feed our appetite and the porn industry they say is a is a, a booming and big big revenue industry and, and all kinds of stories behind you know there's a, a sex slave trade and broken lives and 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 all that is fueled by men who are unguarded and undiscerning and this is the pathway to destruction Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 3 says and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air you know I just want to draw attention to verse 1 it says you walked according to the course of this world this this is the course this is a season in other words the greek word is season eon of this world it's like a it's like a pathway the course of this world in that particular season it says you once walked and it is according to the prince of the power of the air and being men we're moving on to other things that are our battles that are our struggles that are our challenges and being men you know our identity when we talk about our identity you know who we are what we value where we draw our self worth from where we draw our self esteem from you know our identity and our and our identity influences our values our our actions and choices everything right so if our identity is tied to money if our identity is tied to let's say a net worth right what we possess you know net worth to me you know just a definition value of all the assets minus the total of all our liabilities it is what we own minus what we owe right and if our identity is tied to our net worth and every time the net worth shakes or changes or goes down our identity is shaken so we want to go after pursue and drive and make sure that this is secure that this does not change and anything that attacks anything that compromises as we are we are willing to go at it we are willing to pursue irrespective of you know whatever values that we might hold if our identity is tied down to our net worth right 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10 for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil it's a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness okay the love of money you know we all need money yes or no we all need money we need to pay bills right we need to pay the bills for this we all need money money is something that's necessary it's a necessity But the bible says that you know the love of money the love of money it says it's a root right it's a root system and if our root system is in the law of money then it's a root for all kinds of evil to bear fruit in our lives all kinds of evil and it says that um, you know because of which some have strayed from the faith maybe strong believers we we thought oh, they are unshakable they've got it all together but they've strayed in their faith and this straying happens over time it's not an overnight thing right strayed from their faith in their greediness that excessive want for more and more and more and and not being satisfied yes there is a place for ambition there is a place for growth but the bible is talking about greed which leads to straying from the faith and it's all connected to the love of money so if our identity is tied to that then we have a problem it also leads to comparison because i have it or i don't have it 
and someone has it or i i have it and someone has even more and it bothers us i you know i drive this car and this person drives a beautiful better faster shinier car and and if my identity is identity is tied to the net worth or you know money and all that comes with it i'm i'm deeply disturbed right we compare and this comparison leads to covetousness and saying you know i i want that i need that i want what he has i want what they have what i have is good hey but this that i to my eyes this seems better and when i get that better then i feel good i feel good i feel a sense of completeness and worth and and identity and all that so i want that so this drive to you know covet something and this drive for covetousness the bible says that this desire this drive for covetousness it even replaces the desire that we may have for the lord and the things of the lord right for the word of god or you know whatever ministry your church worship whatever you know colossians 3 and verse 5 it says therefore put to death your members which are on the earth fornication uncleanness passion evil desire and covetousness which is idolatry covetousness which is idolatry meaning that it replaces god takes the place of god in our lives the desire for god and everything is replaced with this this becomes an idol and if we going to the next one in if our self worth is tied down to fame and popularity then again there is a problem when our self worth is based on financial success we feel value only when we achieve our goals and experience a significant loss of self esteem during setbacks or seasons of failure when our faith, when our self worth is based on accomplishments we constantly seek external validation and feel inadequate or anxious when we are not achieving or recognized for our efforts you know we're not talking about you know healthy accomplishments and you know going after something and having a vision and you know fulfilling that we're not talking about that when our sense of self worth is tied down to that there's a fine line right there's a problem when our self worth is based on accumulation of material possessions we develop a superficial sense of happiness leading to constant comparison with others and never feeling f- truly satisfied or fulfilled and when our self worth is based on fame and popularity we tend to sacrifice our values our true values and relationships in pursuit of recognition and feel empty when the attention fades we feel lost all of us you know we could be in different seasons of life and maybe we are working right now working professionals and and maybe we've moved on to you know uh, uh, retired life but if our self worth is coming from what i'm doing what i'm achieving what i'm you know getting receiving uh, you know who i know and what people say and acknowledge and what approval i get then there's a deep sense of disapproval and 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 maybe even depression why why am i here for even our self worth is based on likes views and followers and social media we become dependent on external approval leading again to anxiety insecurity and a self image that's distorted right because we present an image and that is not who we are and uh, that is not getting the enough attention that's not getting the likes it's not getting the the following and though and so there is a and there's a disconnect we feel very insecure and lastly our sense of self esteem you know when it comes to control of people and situations you know, we could be in leadership positions and yes there is a there's an aspect of being in charge and leading and and organizing and and uh, and you know ensuring that everything happens but if our self esteem is tied to that sense of control when you look at media it glorifies characters you know assert control over every aspect of their own lives 
every aspect of lives and others you know i say it and i do it that person does it i get it done and if our self esteem is based on that then again we go after it we don't care if the person whom we are controlling is a human being created in the image of god right and so low self esteem results in feelings of insecurity about one's own abilities and worth and so to compensate for this we compromise our values and we want to control the environment control the people no matter what no matter what so this is you know this is the world we live in and the bible talks about that there is this lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh and pride of life and this is the path this is the path of the world and we are here you know in the world we could be believers we could be the church right we are we are the church of the living god but we are there is a drawing and with that drawing there is also a giving in at times right because the draw is very seducing it's very inviting and we give in to that which results in addictions which results in broken lives which results in a low grade fever you know we are there we are reading the bible but there seems to be some kind of a of a veil we seem to be close but we are not close with god lord i am close but i am not close enough we seem to be close to our spouse but we are not close enough something is there something is troubling me and that's a god given conviction praise god for that right is he indwells us but society and culture and media just says hey that's normal maybe you're going through a midlife crisis that is all yeah. now two years back i you know just got into this hobby bird watching and i remember what my brother you know said hey is he going through some midlife crisis or something <laughs> you know so we we sometimes say okay maybe he's going through a midlife crisis hey this is this is it you're in a different season yeah after the children are grown up and all that and hey, it's it's normal not to feel close to your wife you've celebrated your 25th anniversary great that's fine but you know a distance happens water flows under the bridge it's okay it's not okay it's not okay because it's the path of the world it's a course of the this is where we are and i know it's a grim picture to start the conference right but it's a real picture these are real stories and this is a real scenario right so what we're going to do now is um take some time right um maybe for the first 5 minutes or 10 minutes in our groups take some time to to introspect and identify what are these attitudes that i have what is that motives intentions that i have and maybe habits that i have in my life that draws me into the realm of this desire right it could be an attitude attitude meaning hey this is what it is it's fine it's normal it could be a motive or intention right or it could be a habit something that i indulge in that seems to draw me deeper and deeper into these realms of desires lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh and the pride of life so just for us to introspect and even as we introspect we can just ask the lord lord you you speak to me god you know you are here you are with me and i just want to get real right you speak to me is there anything that is drawing me over and over again taking me deeper and deeper into this is there anything that's drawing me and um, once we are done with that the rest of the time you know till about till paul pastor paul comes you know we can discuss this just want to read out those questions what are some of the spiritual emotional physical relational and financial consequences you know because these consequences reach out in all these realms all these areas all these aspects so what are these consequences of giving in to the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh second question how can we identify the symptoms and manifestations of the pride of life 
know, when pride of life manifests, what is it and how can we identify the symptoms? Third, third one, what are some of the spiritual, emotional, physical, relational and financial consequences of pursuing the pride of life? You know, we talked about a few of them, scenarios, but then what is it? Right? So um, we can share with each other and uh, around 11, uh, we can close with prayer and, um, and then Pastor Paul would come. Right? So let's take some time to do this in our own groups. Right? Maybe if you're sitting alone, you can be part of another group. Um, and if there are very few people in a group, maybe you can join two groups together, etc. Right? Thank you.